Hey, John, what is going on? Hey, man, I, uh, I'm good. I, I just had a great meal yesterday at Orlando's Cafe in Shreveport. Yeah, <laughs> a simple plate of red beans and rice that filled me up and I took some home. So I had it for breakfast this morning. Red beans, rice and sausage uh, from Orlando's. Uh, hats off to my uh, friend Chapo Chapman, who is running a great place and I'm so glad that it's back open in limited capacity. But yeah, I'll send you some next time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 all I need is a tartar sauce. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I need I, I, the tartar I, I, that sauce. Happen. Yeah, that'll travel oh. well. But yeah, oh. wonderful. Can't wait to go back. And they're back open for seating inside. So everybody should run out and uh, support it. It was great. And I felt no, no one was near me while me and my buddy had a great lunch. So oh my now God, I had man. This, Sausage man, and red beans for, for breakfast was delicious. Man, you hit me one right there. I, I wasn't <laughs> ready because me and my me and my wife, uh, my uh, uh, we brought my mom out here to stay with us, and she said, "Oh, she said I'm bringing tartar sauce." Yeah. <laughs> so she brought the tartar sauce. She went back home. And we're like, when are you coming back? And she was like, well, I'm thinking about coming. She, and then she stopped me away. She said, y'all just want more tartar sauce, don't you? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll get you some. And, uh, how about those, uh, how about them uh, stuffed shrimp? You know, for years, Freeman and Harris was where I would eat breakfast when I worked downtown uh, at least once or twice a week. And I would treat myself to stuffed shrimp for lunch on my birthday every year back in those days so they're oh, back in Shreveport uh just off of I-20 so uh what a what a day that was yesterday I'm still living off of that meal but oh, we didn't yeah. want to start talking food uh it, but that's a historic restaurant 100 years in the family and it's all started right there uh, at the uh, border of Allendale neighborhood and, and Ledbetter Heights, formerly known as the Bottoms. And it was the Bottoms, called the Bottoms, St. Paul, uh, St. Paul's Bottoms when they started. And it, it's just a historic uh, site and, and a great meal, uh, man. It's, yeah, I mean, it, I, I, re I remember growing up, going to uh, Freeman and Harris and sitting at the bar, right? They used to have that bar up yeah. front. Nice to sit <laughs> yeah. at that bar. Uh, and you know, I, I have fun, fun memories of uh, Freeman and Harris, man. And like you said, it brings back so many memories of the bottoms, of just the, just the whole, um, just the, uh, just you know, just the reminisce about it and the good food and the good people. I mean, you just, oh my God, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and that area was a thriving business community. It was African-American, uh, primarily businesses, mm -hmm. and, and it all began to decay when they built uh, I-20 through, uh, basically an I-20 inner city connector through Shreveport and on through Bossier. And with that began the uh, out-migration of, of uh, uh, white businesses from downtown, and uh, but also African American businesses from uh, that area, that region, which we call uh, Lakeside, Ledbetter, and Allendale. It, it just was uh, uh, destroyed a lot of small businesses, which a city needs in order to really be strong. Is you need those small mom and pop restaurants that give your city flavor in character instead of tasting like you're in Dallas or anywhere else, you know, it's a very specific to the region. Uh, yeah. So that brings us to what I wanted to visit with you about. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, uh, you have some info about, um, uh, um, uh, some more info about Mayor Pete. We're going to get him on. We're, we're, we're shooting for the moon and shooting for the stars. We're going to get Mayor Pete on here, but you have some more information about, uh, Mayor Pete and his uh, his confirmation hearing. Yeah, and a uh, shout out to uh, Dorothy Wiley, whose podcast has been with you, has been really big on Facebook. Dorothy has written a, a letter 
to uh, incoming Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, to sort of introduce ourselves and make that initial contact that we've made over these years with all of our uh, uh, Secretaries of Transportation in DC. But as hearing, I watched it uh, live and I guess I'm just that uh, wonkish or geeky that I, I would really enjoy uh, a Senate <laughs> confirmation hearing for Secretary of Transportation, but there's so much uh, to look forward to for Allendale and for the nation in, uh, in Pete Buttigieg's uh, administration, the Biden-Harris administration. Um, the, he was, uh, he did a great job and, and there are things uh, I can give you some background. For instance, I didn't know that uh, the Democrats in the Senate have already introduced a bill to set $10 billion aside for removing inner city connectors, such as, oh. yeah, the inner city connector that went to Shreveport and killed all of the businesses on either side of it uh, for a mile or so on either side. And, and uh, the $10 billion is sort of to seed a project and, and experiment with it, but with Dallas already removing their uh, one of their inner city connectors in Houston and Syracuse and about 26 other cities have already done this, Seattle, uh, yeah. So uh, the idea is to remove, to spend money that you would have spent rebuilding an aging inner city highway and remove it. And, and then you don't just leave it rubble, you, you put back what was there to begin with, neighborhoods, with neighborhood businesses that one could walk to and, and get breakfast, one could walk to and, and get a job cooking, you know, or selling uh, parts for bicycles and selling bicycle shops like Dorothy hopes to get started and, um, and all sorts of little neighborhood businesses that sort of make life uh, more livable and also keep us healthier because you don't need a car. You can just walk and go get your groceries at the local grocery store. Th those sorts of things are, are, uh, have been done away with by our car centric culture, our, our tendency to say everything's better with a car. It's not a study recently said that you need $800 a month to, to drive a car, you know, between all of the expenses, the insurance, the parts repairs, the gas, $800 a month. Well, if your income is only say 1600 or $2,000 a month, uh, for, for uh, your, your wages, how are you gonna pay $800 for a car every month to get to work and back? It's, it's almost a negative, you know, then you still gotta pay rent, which is high now. And uh, all of these things were unforeseen consequences of the big move after the 50s, uh, after World War II in the 50s to build a nation that ran on uh, the big three automakers product and big oil. So uh, these are exciting times because we can get back to the way our grandparents did things, which was uh, healthier and uh, less expensive. Give us more money to spend on things we need when we don't need a car anymore to survive. But yeah, that neighborhood that was Freeman and Harris had, had, at one time had everything. And it, you know, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, little shops and gas stations and, uh, and all through Allendale, you know, and these places are now empty and boarded up since the interstate came through. And since we basically um, shot ourselves in the foot by embracing car technology, car auto transportation to the degree that we did, it, it, uh, it basically strands people who can't afford a car in their own neighborhood and the shops aren't in business. So what do you do? Yeah, it, I mean, <clears throat> um, I, I watch um, a lot of PBS uh, digital studio um, uh, recordings on YouTube. And one of my favorite uh, videos um, is, and I hope I, I might even put a link uh, uh, on the uh, YouTube channel um, 
to it, uh, it talks about how the vehicle, how cars are a drag to, um, to people. You already um, know that, you know, cars depreciate over time. Um, uh, you know, these classic cars, yes, right? Uh, I, watched, I watched an episode of uh, where uh, uh, Nick Cannon was talking about how he bought a car and it appreciated. But guess what? He had to spend <laughs> the initial 200000 to get the car for yeah. it to appreciate, right? And then it was like right. this. You had to be uh, this special person. Like they had to invite you to buy the car. So you're not buying the car and it's going to appreciate you. You literally will have, you know, cars these days. Um, and I look at my car that I just bought. I bought my car used and um, I knew as soon as I bought it used, right? I bought it used. It was already depreciated by $4,000. And it, it was a 2020, and I bought it last year, 2020. And now um, what I'm trying to do is try to stay ahead of the appreciate the depreciation right. by making sure my payments, um, I, I put a, a large down payment and I'm paying it down. So by the end of the year, I'm ahead of the depreciation. So if something was to happen, then I will be able to pay off the loan. Right. But a lot of people, you know, when you buy a car, it's usually, you know, a used car. Um, you pay 7000 for it, something like, you know, a 10-year-old car already has like 75,000 miles on it. And now you have to keep it up because in 25,000 miles, it, and that's, all, that's a Hyundai. Let's say a Toyota or something like that. The, you know, the warranty is already gone. You have to pay for that. You have to pay for that maintenance. You have to pay for all of that. And that usually adds on uh, uh, pricing that we don't usually look at. We don't usually look at a car and say, okay, I got this car. You just think of the payment, the insurance, because that, that's payment. It's an insurance that you know is coming out. But now I got gas. And now uh, I have to change the oil, right? Then on top of that, I have tires. I have. Oh yeah! And if yeah. you're driving Freeport, you're gonna need new tires a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you drive, hey, you drive anywhere because you know I stay here in Atlanta, and yeah, anybody can tell you about 10th Street, right? 10th Street yeah. is the yeah. worst street. But you know, you also have just regular maintenance. So, you know, your, your alternator, your you know, uh, mm -hmm. spark plugs. You know, just, just just random things that people don't think about when they buy a vehicle. That upkeep is something that that we don't usually look at a vehicle and say, "How much is the upkeep?" All right? That's, those are not the questions you ask the dealership. All right? You usually right. catch that on the back end. Right? It's like yeah, owning a house. No, like <laughs> there you right. go. But that, that's the, the wonderful thing about this new age. Uh, I, I call it a return to the future because the Obama administration was headed in this direction, but their eight years were up and uh, we went in a different direction. Or Really, we didn't go anywhere the last four years. Nothing much happened in transportation. But now the future's back. And so I would expect that this year we could see uh, a bill coming out of the Senate actually, which seems odd because they haven't produced anything in years, <laughs> but a bill coming out of the United States Senate that, that begins the process of, uh, uh, or formalizes it, it's already been underway of removing inner city connectors from cities and putting back profitable uh, um, businesses and, and, and private real estate, which actually can provide more tax base. Uh, yeah, it, it could be a totally different uh, 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 event horizon for Allendale for the next four years as we begin talking about how do we get that boulevard we've wanted. Uh, we've been talking about as a, a reasonable alternative to a highway to connect I-49 where it terminates at the southern end and the northern uh, side of the city. We've, we've been talking about this as long as I've been in the group for five years, I think maybe longer, I just wasn't a member. Mm -hmm. 
but of building a modern business boulevard that enhances business opportunity for those local businesses that are along the boulevard. Uh, it's better than one of those, uh, Chuck Marone calls it a strode. It's a street and a road hybrid that it's basically like your cars are going almost as fast as they would on a highway, but it's serving as a street where businesses locate and, and shoppers come to buy goods and spend their money and pay into the, uh, to the uh, sales taxes uh, fund that Shreveport depends on. This will, this will make that easier to get in and out of without getting killed at all, as the old song goes. You know, you can actually pull off without fear of getting rear-ended by a guy who's, who's uh, looking at his phone and didn't see your brake lights. Uh, easier for you to walk. Uh, they, it would create sidewalks on these roads. Uh, I'm thinking of North Market for Shreve Porters or Uri Drive for South Shreve Porters. Uh, if you live on one side and got to get to your bank on the other side and you're bringing your two kids, I've seen this a million times, you got to carry one and push the other one in the stroller and hope to get across five lanes of traffic going around 50 miles an hour without getting killed and your baby's killed. Um, you know, it's, it's just makes so much more sense to slow cars down just a little bit. Uh, you can cut out the the lights at the intersections by putting in a roundabout, you know, uh, traffic circle, some people call them, but, uh, but yeah, the traffic doesn't have to stop and wait at a light forever. They can just cruise through the circle and, and make their way on down if they're not stopping in any of those businesses. Uh, but if you're a pedestrian trying to cross, it gives you an island where you, if you can make it across halfway, you can stop on that island and not worry about getting hit until there's another decent break in the traffic instead of just standing out in the middle of the street with cars whizzing by. It's just so much safer, uh, so good for businesses because people sometimes say, I'd love to pull in here, but I don't want to break my 50 mile an hour travel to my real destination. But with the slower traffic, you're more prone to pull into that little uh, a hardware store, that little uh, mom and pop sandwich shop that uh, that basically keeps the money right here in the hometown where we're living off of our own money instead of depending on a franchise, which are lovely people that own franchises and now entrepreneurial, I get it, but a portion of that money we spend there goes off to the headquarters where, you know, wherever that is. And a uh, homemade hamburger right here in Shreveport is always going to taste just a little bit better than Mickey D's or, or Burger King, you know, oh, but yeah, if you definitely. don't have that option, what are you going to do? You're headed to Burger King or Mickey D's. So yeah, I this mean, is it, the new beginning. Yeah. I, the, the business Boulevard uh, really becomes something for Shreveport where interstate and I always tell, you know, I'm on the road a lot um, going to places I would rather pull in outside of the city than inside of the city, right? right. So I would rather hit, you know, uh, um, go outside of Bossier, get food outside of Bossier, right, in Ruston or something like that that's right off the interstate, then drive right through Shreveport to get to Dallas, right? I, I'm not trying to stop in the city because usually when you stop in the city, you have to drive further into the city to, to get stuff done, right? And right. with the inner city connector, what we're doing, we're, we're building something to help people get away from Shreveport when we should be trying to slow you down when you get to Shreveport to say, hey, come and try our Orlando's. Come and try out, you know, uh, 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 the donut shop, right? Come and, come and get some food from our local people in a business boulevard, instead of building the inner city connector where I can hurry up and, and get past Shreveport. I always, the, the thing people always say about Shreveport, they say, man, it got real bright <laughs> and all of a sudden it got real dark. And you know why? It got real bright 
and they passed right by downtown, right by the boats, right? Didn't even think about shopping. They weren't even thinking about shopping. They said, I wanted to get gas outside in Greenwood. Yeah, yeah it's so easy. Mind. Right. And, yeah. And, uh, I, I have one uh, caveat to that. That was probably back when we could afford to keep all the lights on the interstate lit. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> because uh, that, that responsibility inside the city limits falls on the cities and with the tight times we've been in for some years now, you know, 220, which is the loop, um, the lights were going off on the uh, on the bridge uh, across Cross Lake, the 220 bridge, that I actually rolled video recorded with my phone sitting on the dash at night and counted out loud the number of lights that were out and published that. And then all of a sudden they found a way to get them going again but you know if one goes one day you don't notice it then there's two out and after a while you like that frog in the hot water you suddenly realize there's no lights on this highway <laughs> and that's i researched it and found out that's because they can't afford to keep them electrified so yeah. sometimes they have a very slow sort of rolling blackout where one area won't get electrified at night and another area will and you can sort of make up in your own mind you can solve that equation with which neighborhoods get the preferential lighting treatment and which there ones don't well uh, interstate it's easy to turn the lights off there and no one feels like they've been uh, discriminated against so a lot of mm -hmm. times those big lights that are way up over the highway start going dark and you, you just have to learn to speak up yeah, and, and, and that kind of segues us into, uh, you know, our next topic of what else could we spend this money on, right? There's $800 million to $1 billion to build this intercity, intercity uh, connector. What else can we spend our portion on, right? And one of the things you brought up earlier was, uh, was the business boulevard, and then... Um, one of the other things we brought up in the last podcast was how they took away a hundred million dollars from the Jimmy Davis bridge, right. Um, to build, um, to, to help build I-49 in the city connector. Right. Uh, I, I mean, how do you feel about them taking that money away from already dig ready construction? It, it was shovel ready for February, 2020. But uh, um, in 2019's legislative session, a group of our, you know, we're all sort of in different, five different regions. Here in Northwest Louisiana, our legislative delegation led by uh, Senator, uh, State Senator Barrow Peacock, a Republican, um, decided to pull, uh, to appeal to the legislature to move that 100 million that was from boycott BP from the BP oil spill, uh, $700 million they paid the state in damages and a hundred million of it was set aside to rebuild and expand the Jimmy Davis bridge named after a former governor who owned the land where the bridge sits across the Red River in Shreveport, in South Shreveport, South Bossier. So they moved that hundred million away uh, in hopes, and I'm sure they had some good word coming from somewhere in Washington, that if, if they moved the hundred million and put it towards the inner city connector, I-49, that federal dollars would fall out of the sky. This was Senator Peacock's, will bring down federal dollars. <laughs> he used his hands. And I thought, yeah, it'll just come trickling down like all trickle down comes to me, but, but uh, the, the Peacock uh, Gambit did not work. So along comes 2020 in February. And as uh, our uh, state uh, secretary of transportation for Louisiana, Sean Wilson uh, told me in a, in a uh, we messaged back and forth and I asked him, he said, yeah, it was ready for February 2020. Now we won't have any money to fund it. So we'll have to go back to the drawing boards. And I learned last week that uh, at the uh, monthly 
regular meeting of the Council of Governments for this region, they're back at the drawing boards again. So it won't, it, the project won't start. We could have had those jobs and we could have had the, the uh, repair work and improvement work on the Jimmy Davis Bridge starting last February, a year ago. And we've gone a whole year without it. So now problems are, uh, you gotta go back and reassess the needs, uh, the dangers that they've declared that it's in no imminent danger of collapse. So it could be that it'll hold up for some time while they continue to do those uh, environmental impact studies and uh, all of the different technical uh, studies that need to be done. And they still say it'll cost between 80 million and $100 million, which they don't have unless it moves back from this bigger project. So there's no funding for it except to study it. And it's hoped that it won't fall in the river any time soon. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's missteps such as that, that, uh, you know, to me, uh, growing up with a grandfather who relied on a lot of uh, old sayings to communicate truth to me, he used to say a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. They had a hundred million to fix the bridge but he went for two projects that were imaginary, the fixing the bridge and building a billion dollar highway through Allendale and he got neither. So, you know, lessons learned. Uh, he's younger than me. Maybe he didn't hear those sorts of uh, <laughs> old sayings. <laughs> oh, he heard them. He probably heard, but he probably heard somebody that was more about financing his, his campaign and his, yeah. Telling so him, you know, speculate, but yeah, it was a bad move and, and it was bungled. And so now to uh, add some misery to it, that bridge, which was built, you know, uh, in the mid sixties, I don't remember exactly when I was a child, uh, believe it or not, uh, I was alive in the sixties and I remember the sixties. I remember the bridge being completed, but it's about 50 years old which uh, renders it a historic designation that if they pulled the trigger and said, yeah, this is a historic bridge, uh, it's certainly no Edmund Pettus bridge, but it still is a historic ancient structure by transportation, then that would change the way you have to work with rebuilding it and keep it fairly constrained to just uh, two lanes. Mm -hmm. And they'd like to expand it to four lanes to have will handle the overflow traffic at certain times of the day or build a sister span. That's how you wind up not being able to afford infrastructure though. If you build it bigger or build a second bridge, now you got two bridges you got to take care of in there you go. 30, 40, 50 years. But did you grow your pot of money? Did you double that? So it, it's, a, a, it's a real mess and they screwed that up. You know, it was divisive in the community because even Republicans who love that bridge and live in Bossier and drive on it every day were mad because they're frankly afraid to drive on it. It looks raggedy and it is, it's old. You yeah. know, yeah. I actually know someone who had a piece of it fall through the windshield of her car one day uh, a few years ago when she was on the way to work in the, the giant bolt from way up landed right on her, uh, on her windshield and in her car. So um, it's not a good idea to play with that. If you got a bird in the hand, you need to go on and take it. Uh, there you go. Not wait on the second one that might happen some, someday because along comes uh, modern times. And uh, I, I think we're uh, in for a really good year. Although I, I'm sure they're the committee of 100, uh, is sitting on their pile of money that they plan to spend on convincing us that their way is the better way. I just don't mm -hmm. think that's going to go very far. I hope they'll s keep their wallets in their back pocket and, uh, and um, maybe we could work together as two organizations that are popular and respected within the city to do something jointly with our funds and their funds to improve Shreveport. Uh, and, and so okay. Um, so I, and, and I I have another one. Real, uh, I, I have like two or three more to shoot at you, right? Okay. The next one is, and I, and I think we talked about this at another time. The a pedestrian bridge 
over Red River that will connect the uh, shopping area in Bossier to um, where, you know, they've been trying to do the festival area over in Shreveport. Yeah, I, yeah that was cool. There's actually a sidewalk on that. Uh, we call it the Texas Street Bridge that mm -hmm. comes from the center of our downtown across the Red River and basically puts you out very near. Uh, there are a few shops there in Bossier, but very near that uh, mall the uh the uh that's right there on the yeah, river the boardwalk. yeah the boardwalk and it, and it has great walking uh it's it's a little bit uninviting like i if i was gonna walk it and i, I could walk it i'm still a young man uh I, it's a yes, little you are. yes you are yeah it is a steep but i would like you know a rail between me and the traffic coming along uh the bridge because it can cross 45 50 miles an hour and i would feel more comfortable there's there's things that like that that you can do like if we uh and i, I understand there'll be a, a pedestrian and bike lane across this new bridge because they're federal dollars to support that so yeah we could do that with federal dollars that aren't included in the 800 million what would i do with 800 million dollars in shreveport if we didn't build this well of course uh build the boulevard, our engineers and uh, city planners that support us say that might cost as much as $70 million. That would still leave you at least, you know, another $700 million if there were cost overruns. Uh, I would start, and this is, this is a little bit uh, crazy sounding to people who live way out in the, in the uh, gated communities, but I would actually start by repairing every pothole, uh, overlaying every street in our poorest neighborhoods, you know, that are centrally located. I'm thinking right now of Leadbetter Heights where Leadbelly stomped the grounds uh, during his uh, amazing career of, uh, of Allendale where Confederate soldiers and slaves uh, and Americans of every stripe over the years. It was an Italian neighborhood for a while with Italian groceries, but it's historic. And I would redo all the streets, you know, because uh, uh, Lakeside, Queensboro, uh, out North Market Way with the MLK neighborhood, they've been neglected because they don't have the economic power to. Uh, force an election you know they can't do like committee 100 does and find two candidates to run against you if you don't do what they want you to do so i, I would do a major overhaul of shreveport's inner city neighborhoods streets and drainage and ignore the rest it'll be okay for a while that would be like an extra boost to get shreveport going again and my observation is that uh Shreveport's really only as strong as its weakest links. You know, our weakest neighborhoods are links in a chain that we call Shreveport. And if we can't take care of uh, our weakest links, we're gonna be a weak city without much hope of ever uh, growing and getting out of this financial mess we're in. It starts in the heart of Shreveport in the center of our city in our weakest neighborhoods. We need to spend money to strengthen education, to strengthen streets and drainage, just in those neighborhoods that have basically supported the city for centuries, but have been neglected. Uh, likewise, they've been neglected forever uh, by our white power structure that tends to favor the new glitzy or uh, gated communities that are too far away to be of any that there's no way they pay for their their place here. They they can't you can't possibly tax them enough to pay for how much they cost us in delivering fresh water and pumping away their their sewage all those miles. Uh, we actually had to build a, a wastewater treatment plant specifically for Southeast Shreveport because they just grew so far away from the old wastewater treatment plant that now we need two. Well, they're not paying double the taxes to support both. So you wind up going broke, but yeah, there's so much we could do here to improve education, improve basic services, more police, you know, we're 
in the middle of a crisis. But so it, you know, I'm glad you brought up police because I'm gonna throw out another idea mm -hmm. for, uh, for money that we can use instead of building the, NS, the uh, ICC is, and they're doing this in Brookhaven and they've done this in California, first responding law officers, instead of having actual officers go, they would have a drone. They do this in here in Brookhaven, Georgia, uh, suburb of Atlanta, and they also do it in a suburb uh, out in California where they send a drone out first to check it out, right? And yeah. then you send the cops in. So when you send a drone out, you're looking down, you're, you're, you're you know, taking uh, um, uh, assessment of the situation and you're understanding the situation and then you send out the cops. Now the cops know what's going on. They know what's, you know, because uh, they, they use mm -hmm. the example, uh, two examples in California where um, there was a, a, a guy, he, he was suspicious. He looked suspicious. He was in his car. So they, they get there and the guy is in his car and they find out he's doing meth. He jumps out, takes off running. So he takes off running and he throws his gun and the drugs in the trash can. And, but there's a drone following him. Right, yeah. So he's, he's throwing this stuff away so they catch him. You know, they, they don't do this, you know, big car, you know, car chase or whatever. They, they actually, you know, they're following around. It's a drone right above him. You know, he's running and he it's almost like he's oblivious to this thing <laughs> above his yeah, head. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden, you know, he's surprised because they're right around the corner. Like, man, how did y'all? So, and then, and, and, and that right there, they took away, you know, the need to, uh, you know, they knew exactly where this guy was at. They just cornered him. Boom, done, right? They knew he didn't have a gun on him. They knew he where he threw the gun and the drugs at. So it wasn't any, it, it, they knew the situation, exactly what the situation was. Without a drone, they wouldn't have known this guy had even had a gun, but they also would have known the guy threw it away in this spot, all right? Right. Second situation, which I love this situation, the guy had a, uh, somebody said that he had a gun at a fast food restaurant. This is California. So they, they pull it, the, the drone gets there, observe the guy. He pulls out this, this little pistol, right? This little pistol puts his, you know, has rolled up weed in his hand, puts it in his mouth, lights it. It's not a gun. It's, it, it's not a gun, right? Yeah. So they're like, ah, oh, don't worry. You know, the drone guy say, ah, oh, don't worry about it. You know, this guy, it's a lighter. It's not really a gun. It's a lighter that looks yeah. like a gun, All right? Yeah. Oh my God! That, I mean, that right, that situation within itself was enough to make me become a fan of it. Now you yeah. looking into could have saved that guy's life if they'd have shown up thinking he's armed. They wouldn't have maybe let him go home. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, That's look at Tamir Rice, right? I always bring up Tamir Rice, twelve-year-old killed. I uh, think he wasn't even twelve. Yeah, killed in a park, had a toy gun, in cops Chicago. didn't even give him the benefit of the doubt. They pulled up and killed him. Just think if they would have had a drone that pulled up, saw right. Tamir Rice playing with a toy gun, and said, "It's a little kid with a toy gun." All right, don't even right. worry about it, like they did with this. Wow, guy. that's so. Art. And how is that working in a southern city, like you mentioned in Georgia? So um, how Brookhaven, long has that been in effect there? Yeah, yeah they Brookhaven. just started it. Yeah, they just started it. Mm -hmm. They uh, they they're they're doing the initial studying. Um, it it, it um, they you know they're doing the figuring money wise. I think in California they were the first two you know, one of the first two started. So the startup cost was 10 million. But, uh, the, you know, they, they were financed uh, with some uh, uh, federal money, uh, financed with some state money, you know, stuff like that, just to give it a test run. Everybody wanted to see how it'll work. 
now Brookhaven's doing it. I think they said four million. I think on next column for next week. I need to research this. Oh, this you know, sounds, I'm gonna send you the link. This sounds amazing. Um, and I'm gonna drop the links in the yeah, YouTube man, channel. Send me the links. Yeah. yeah. And I'm gonna drop the links uh in, in the podcast when we start sending the podcast out. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that I have the links attached. Um, so everybody else that's listening or watching can go out and, and check out these videos. But that right there, that right there um, is just one of the things that we can spend money on, you know, Shreveport can spend money on instead of this inner city connector, right? This boondoggle uh, of, uh, of infrastructure that we can, like you said earlier, we're not bringing in more money by building it. So, no, there's but, no return on the, in, for business people, they call it return on investment. You invest a billion dollars, you expect to make more than a billion dollars off of it. That never happens. They, they wind happens. up just absolutely destroying the property around them. So that's no longer productive property either. So mm -hmm. you have this formerly, you know, productive property, even if it was low productivity, it's got great potential and it destroys it. Hey, man, I want to get back in there uh, and uh, write about this new idea uh, in my next uh, column that I produce every week. So that's hey, a fantastic hey. idea I had not heard of. I'm so glad you uh, you made me aware of that. And you all you of know, that, that's why we have this podcast, to mm -hmm. throw our ideas. We're idea guys, right? Yeah, we yeah. have this podcast to throw our ideas back and forth at each other and then have the viewers and the listeners come back and comment on it on the YouTube or comment on, on the Facebook page. So, you know, we're fleshing out ideas. And, and yeah. that's the great thing about this podcast is because we can look at what other people with their mistakes. We, we're readers, right? We read right. newspaper, we, we watch the news, you know, we, interesting stuff happen, we research it. And we're able to put out this information using this podcast, put out our research, put out, you know, something that most people probably won't even, you know, think about, right? They, they're sitting at the house, they're watching their, their Netflix and they say, oh, let me go to the store. They listen to our podcast on the way to the store and they yeah. hear about a pedestrian bridge in Little Rock, Arkansas, right? They mm -hmm. hear about um, drone police in, in Brookhaven, Georgia and, and in the suburbs of, of, uh, of California. And now they're like, oh, I never heard of yeah. that, right? Uh, yeah. So, and that, I'm gonna bring that, up this- That's a good idea. It deserves immediate attention from oh, my yeah. friends on the city council and our uh, police chief our mayor, who's uh, uh, two years into his term and looking for re-election, this could be a great addition to a bond issue on policing. Uh, police and fire is critical to our well-being here, and that's the sort of thing that could help us out. A great there you go. There you go. Yeah. And I'm, I have one more. I'm going to have one more. I'm bring, and this actually is going to segue us into another podcast that we're going to do Um um, and it is, we can, another idea is to turn Swepco in Swepco Park into right. a walking park and using that area right behind the Swepco, uh, it's like a little, little, uh, like a little grassy area using that area all the way up to 12 mile Bayou to and Red River and turning that into a walking park. Right. Oh yeah, sure. I, and I, 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 from what I hear, uh, you know, I love Swepco Park, and we still use it. Uh, previous mayor unparked it, as we say, pulled up all everything. Uh, tried to pull up the pavilion, saying it, been, it was old, been built in the fifties. That was a lie. It, mm -hmm. it had been built uh, during Cedric Glover's uh, first term on the city council, so maybe twenty-five years old, not fifty. Uh, so we actually staged a sit-in and prevented them from removing that. But everything else is gone. We still hold giant uh, get-togethers in that park because it's part of the heart. But yeah, as a, a walking trail, there's the makings of a walking trail that was planned 
when uh, Fuller Center for Housing uh, was building those new homes there and revitalizing the neighborhood by putting Alice residents in new homes that they owned. And, and those homeowners uh, wanted a walking trail to the park. And so the basics are there for that and to uh, make it a, an even more inviting park. It's got a couple of really great hills that are tied in to that are actually the remains of the Civil War fort that happen to be really not only great for rolling cannons up the hill, but they're really great for uh, climbing. And, and uh, there's just so much potential there too, because uh, SWEPCO, the Southwestern Electric Power Company under the AEP family of power companies is gonna close that old plant that was generating electricity because they've now uh, um, transitioned into a more modern way that um, doesn't use old, chemi uh, old coal and all of that goes with that with the pollution. So uh, they're going to close that plant. There's a huge field there that I think would make uh, excellent, uh, you know, soccer fields, baseball fields, that sort of thing to, to host tournaments near downtown. Uh, you know, it, it could, that park could easily be expanded and turned into something really amazing right on the edge of downtown. Yeah, there, there's no reason not to do it and uh, accept the will of the people of Shreveport, you know, if they will ask their, their uh, government representatives, hey, this is what we want. And that's part of what's missing in Shreveport. Uh, the planners, the city planners that live and work here are not listened to. They're not respected for what they do, you know, by the city leadership, uh, you know, the uh, Shreveport leadership tends to be stuck in the way their parents were successful in the 50s and 60s when there was a ton of oil here. So whatever we were doing then must have worked. No reason to stop doing that. But it's time for Shreveport to lead the nation instead of trail the nation on all these different measures, these uh, wallet hubs and these other organizations that, that measure cities of mid-size and above, we always wind up around 300 to 302nd best city on a list of 302 best cities in the nation. And I say, wake up leadership. You know, your best thinking Shreveport leadership has led us right to that spot. We're in the 302nd best city to raise a family, to make, uh, start a career, all of those. We're always, at the bottom and that's our fault, you know, and that's our Shreveport leadership's fault for not leading. Uh, they're basically following old ideas that uh, are way past their time. No wonder our young people like you guys all found, a, you know, a calling to move to another city. God called you to live somewhere else besides Shreveport because it, it uh, really isn't that happening of a town anymore. It was once but we've got a lot of very hard work to do. And I'd be excited to talk to you some more about this uh, in another uh, podcast, because I learned something from you today. So I'm deeply appreciative. I'm fixing to go in the kitchen and heat up the last little bit of my red beans and sausage. <laughs> and <laughs> so, hey, so this is a good, a good place to stop then. This is a good yeah. place to end the podcast. Because yeah. uh, uh, um, we have like like you you know we have so many ideas between me and you, um, and then we have some people that can join in on a lot of their ideas, um, and and a lot of the podcasts that we have planned uh, later on, uh, we're going to go into Shreveport Co-op, going to go in more into Swepco Park, um, right, uh, and then and you know and then we're going to also talk about um, and I'm 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 coming up with something a topic to talk about uh, the the notion of brain drain, a city having a brain drain, and how I believe that that is a misnomer. That is not true. It may be that we don't recognize all the brains. Like for too long, Dorothy Wiley, who has a fantastic mind and understanding of best practices for modern cities, has been they, they've 
tried to ignore Allendale and mm -hmm. Allendale's leadership, and uh, it, she just can't be ignored. You know, if you go back and look at her podcast and all of the uh, all of the comments that she got, you know, they're calling for her to run for office. Yeah, because we need we need more brains like Dorothy's at the dais up there in city hall instead of some of what we've got really isn't all that uh, yeah above average i like i like to say that allendale is leading the city whether the city realizes it or not right now but that that that's the place i draw a lot of my inspiration to keep keep looking into this i had no idea what was wrong with infrastructure and inner city highways. I knew something was wrong. You can look out your window as you drive through a city and see it's not really helping, but you wouldn't want it in your neighborhood. You wouldn't buy property next door to an interstate. But uh, I had no idea of how that worked until I, I was asked to start researching it. And my research told me that these guys in Allendale were right on the money with what's wrong and what we could do better so yeah so yeah, yeah. i mean yeah i'm looking forward to talking more about this i, I think we're i don't want to be the old man that talks too long yeah, <laughs> hey, I, hey I, no, no don't worry guy. about it don't worry about it we have time we have time um yeah and then we, so we're gonna stop the, the uh the podcast here but i also i you know i gotta go through the whole the ending part thank you everybody for listening to the allendale strong podcast thank uh, and make sure you watch us on, on the Allendale Strong uh, YouTube page, uh, RDB uh, backslash, I mean, uh, under, RDB underscore on, on YouTube. You can check out our interviews and Allendale podcasts in a video form. And we're going to start putting out the podcast on all the uh, places that you find podcasts. And just look out for that. Also, check out our Facebook page, Allendale Strong Facebook page, Allendale Strong, I, Friends of Allendale Strong, IG page, and Twitter page. And if you see me or John on Twitter, give us a shout out, say hello, do your thing. You see us on the street, make sure you give us a shout out, say hello. You know, uh, if you want to donate, please go to the Facebook page and donate money to the Allendale Strong uh, cause and the community uh, um, a renewal cause, Community Renewal International. Thank you, everybody, for listening to us. You got one last thing you want to say, John? Hey, we're a 501c3 now, so it's tax deductible to donate and don't forget my friends over at Fuller House uh, International, uh, Lee Jeter's doing a great job running Fuller Center here in Shreveport. I just saw today on Facebook, he's uh, building a new house for to put a homeowner in, a first time homeowner is gonna get to live in that house and they participate in the building, make their payments and they own a home. So yeah, lots going on that's positive here. I don't mean to be too negative, but I do mean to get in that kitchen and eat up those. All right, I'm gonna let, go ahead and let you go, you go red eat up those red beans and rice. Thank you, everybody. Y'all have a blessed day. Goodbye. <laughs>